office, right? You know, it is 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 that's a busy day, and uh, I could see some of you nodding off in the last session. But in fairness to you, you was doing it with one eye. It was like that. <laughs> you managed to keep one eye open. <laughs> No, I, I really, I really applaud you. Uh, it's just amazing. And I want to, once again, thank you for this opportunity for uh, letting me uh, teach you today. Yeah, thanks. You, you may have noticed in the last session I was getting a little bit more excited than the earlier ones, a little bit more on my toes. And I tell you why I do that is because some of the truths that we presented in our last session, Satan really attacks. Really attacks. You know, he, he, he's challenging Christians all the time in terms of certain things like what, we, what we've looked at. And what happens in me is I get what, what you might call this righteous anger. I get this holy anger rising up in me because I want Christians to be established in the truth. And Jesus said, the truth will set you free. And uh, we are called to freedom. And Satan tries to lie to us. Um, also, I, I'm glad Jill brought up the thing about the temple, because I, I kind of feel like I want to say as well that, because um, we focused so much on, obviously focused on Jesus and the church and new covenant stuff in this, uh, today's, today's lectures. And I haven't said a great deal about Israel. And, you know, some people, that might bother some people, actually, because, you know, we look into the Old Testament and one might say we see a lot of stuff about Israel as a nation there. Let me just say, um, you know, before we, I get into this session, that if I read Romans 11 correctly, I believe there's a future for Israel. Okay? I believe there's a future for Israel. I, I don't think it's coincidence or accident that they were reestablished as a nation in 1948. And now they're back in, back in their land. I, I, I agree with all, all, all that, okay? Um, but I think, I think what, personally myself, I think what's happened, if I'm honest, is that there's been so much focus on that, is that we have done it at the expense of other truths. So like it might have been the first time for you to hear today, or maybe the first time in a long time, that you are the temple. Whatever we may say about a future temple in terms of the nation of Israel, right? And by the way, we, you know, we could even put a question mark over that because so many, there's so many things that, like, it's future, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's, it, we are not there yet. We can only speak dogmatically on things that we, have, we are living in now or if they're very clear in the Bible. And there's so much ambiguity about some of this stuff. So I believe a lot of it is true. But, like, I don't know about it all. I don't know how it's going to work out. To, to be honest with you, I don't know how it's going to work out. And, of course, you may remember Peter, in First Peter, he actually talks about the prophets in the Old Testament, how they didn't know how it all was going to work out. And it, it, Peter actually says this. They were told the suffering and the glories that would come after. He says that. that they knew that. They knew the sufferings and the glories that would come after. Sufferings of Jesus, the glories that come after is the new covenant realities, okay? But he says this, he says, but they didn't know the times or the circumstances. Now, as a Bible teacher, right, because I'm a Bible teacher, I, I, I can't be as dogmatic on some of these things as some other people <laughs> feel comfortable with, because I don't know. I do believe that Israel, you know, 1948... They came back into their land, they're established as a nation. Like I say, if I read Romans 11 correctly, there's a future for the nation of Israel, and I'm praying for it. Somebody prayed earlier in our prayer meeting, the peace of Jerusalem. I'm right there. Because I think, you know, because I'm so grateful for that nation for providing for us the Messiah. Jesus is a Jew. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. But like I say, I think what's happened is that um, here's a big word, all right. Some of you might not understand this, and it doesn't matter because you know this is not the course. But dispensational theology now is so prominent that it takes up so much room about Israel as a nation that actually we do it at the expense of what the apostles preached on. 
So whatever we may say about a future temple, I want to tell you, once again, on apostolic authority, that whatever the apostles may agree with or disagree with, with that particularly, they would say that the ultimate temple, the ultimate temple is the church. And the new heavens and the new, new earth, which will envelop the whole earth. God's kingdom is from shore to shore, from sea to sea. Do you get my point? Do you hear my heart in this? So I'm pro-Israel, but not at the expense of the church. And not at the expense of a new creation that God has brought about in his people today. And I don't know about you, but when I started talking about the temple earlier, I could feel the Holy Spirit coming into this room. I think people need to know that you are filled and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And right this very moment, you are the connecting point between heaven and earth. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Anyway, you, 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 you get my heart, I'm sure. But like, like I said, the first point is the more important point for me, you see, because I think that, um, that these are the truths that Satan attacks. You know, if he, he, he would love to get you to believe that you're not born again. He would love to get you to believe that. He would love to get you to believe that God, in his, by his Holy Spirit, is not dwelling amongst us and in us. He'd love to get you to believe that. He'd love to get you to believe that you are not in Christ Jesus and experiencing you know, the same blessings that they had in the Old Testament when they were in Canaan. He'd love to get you to believe that. The apostles would want to hit that home. That you are the people of God. You are established in Christ Jesus. You know, it's powerful, powerful truth. I don't know about you, but it keeps setting me free. Even preaching it today, I felt more freedom. So yes, we pray for Israel, right? We pray for them, but we don't forget in the process who we are. You hear me? We, we never forget that, because that's really important. So anyway, this is our last session, and what I plan to do here is like just teach maybe for about 25 minutes, and then have some time of ministry. Should we do that? So how, how are you feeling about this? So, you know, you're gonna, it, is it still a one-eye job, or is it two eyes now? Or, it, <laughs> Yeah, n n nudge each other, right? If you see anybody falling asleep, kind of nudge each other and keep each other awake. Okay, so what I'd like to do in this session is I'd like to finish off zooming in and particularly talking about uh, the person and work of Jesus and how the prophets prophesy about him as a person and, um, you know, and his work. And once again, of course, time is going to be our problem in a sense. Um, because I'm looking at the clock and it's, uh, you know, it, kind of, it kind, of, kind of goes quick, doesn't it? So, so what I'd like to do is, uh, if, you, if you want to turn to John chapter 19, and I'm going to pick up a phrase in one of, these, uh, one of the verses here and then take us back to the Old Testament and discover some amazing things there about Jesus. So John chapter 19, and I'm going to read from verse 1. It says there, so then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may, uh, that you may know I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, here's the phrase, Behold the man. Before we get to that particular phrase there, let me just back up for a moment. Um, just to talk a little bit, if you like, about full, you know, uh, types being fulfilled and prophecies being fulfilled from the Old Testament. Um, it's kind of interesting here that in verse 2, it says there, that, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Now, that's quite interesting. When we read that, we just brush past it sometimes. You know, we don't really think about the significance. But do you remember that back in the Garden of Eden, when mankind fell out of his relationship, broke relationship with God, creation was cursed. And if you remember, God said to Adam, through thorns and thistles, you will have to work. Now, the thing is, of course, is that work is not a curse. Adam worked before the fall. He was told to look after the garden. The curse 
is that work would be hard. <laughs> and I don't know about you, right? I've been involved in church planting. You know, I've planted, been involved in planting a few churches now. Uh, and I can tell you that sometimes it doesn't work out as you think. You feel like it's hard. And life can sometimes feel like that. You feel like you're up against a stiff wind. Do you know what I mean? It's something against you. Uh, it could be like that just in life in general. Like life can sometimes, you feel like you're, you have to put the, you know, put the leg power in. You have to put the paces in to get anywhere. Until, of course, God comes behind us with our breath on our backs and you know, he just makes it all simple. And he can do that, no problem. But, but one of the curses of, crea- of, of you know, back in the garden that was given was the curse on creation. Now, I think here what you find, you see, is that when Jesus has a crown of thorns on his head, it's a picture of how Jesus is reversing the curse. You get the point? And curse came because of sin, and now Jesus is dealing with, the, with sin, deals with the penalty of sin. Now, we have not yet experienced the fulfillment of that, and it won't be until the end of the age when Jesus comes back that the whole thing will be lifted. But I want to tell you, which of course most of you know this already, is that whatever we experience at the end will be because of what Jesus did on the cross. You know, what Jesus has already done, we will experience the benefits of even in the future. So what Jesus did in, the, did in the cross, of course, is just obviously dealt with it all. The cross and the resurrection is what it's all about. So, so there's the kind of like a fulfillment there. And the whole thing about putting a purple robe on him obviously speaks of royalty. Back in those days, roy, uh, purple was about royalty. So you kind of already got a picture here, which is an interesting one, of a suffering king. A king who suffers. That's an amazing revelation as well that I got, is that, you know, um, you know your, your king suffering for you. When I, like, when I first met Jesus when I was in prison, that was amazing enough in itself. But the more and more I get to, got to know him and I realized who he was, I thought, you're that person and you came to me in prison. This is not, this is amazing. Then I discovered he died for me, which we'll come to in a moment. But it's just powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. I like the fact as well that in verse 4, Pilate says, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you, may find, that you may know I find no fault in him. That's also a fulfillment of a type because Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist said that about Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now, back in the Old Testament, when people brought lambs, sacrifices to the high priest, if he brought a lamb, the lamb had to be studied by the high priest. It had to have no spot, no blemish, no broken bones. It had to be a perfect lamb. And, and once the high priest you know, sought, uh, realized that the lamb was perfect, then it was fit and qualified for sacrifice. You brought your best. You brought perfection in that sense. And it's all a picture of Jesus, of course. And interestingly, Pete, uh, Pilate, without even realizing it, he's like, in a sense, been playing the role of the high priest, studying and analyzing Jesus, doesn't even realize it, and goes out to the people and says, I find no fault in him. He, he's like preparing him for crucifixion, and he doesn't even realize what he's doing. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, there's another thing that, P- that Pilate doesn't realize what he's doing, and that's in verse 5, and I love this statement. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember reading that one day, and I thought to myself, man, that's a strange thing to say. I, you know, can I, I think about it now, right? Can you imagine the scene now? Pilate brings Jesus out in front of the people and kind of says, behold the man. Like, what, what on earth is all that about? Have you find, found sometimes you're reading through the Bible and things don't seem to fit? Like, what? That seems strange. And it's like, it, it caught my eye. And so I got to thinking and got to studying and praying about this. And then God started to show me stuff from the Old Testament. So let me take you back to the Old Testament. Um, back in Zechariah chapter 6, from verse 12, it says, Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, and look at this phrase. Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. 
Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. Let me just say something about this council of peace being between them both thing. Um, you know, that could mean peace between God and us. Some translations will actually point out to you, particularly if you've got like um, the Amplified Version, it'll basically point out that peace between them both, both meaning the ministry of, um, of, of king and of priest. King and priest, because a priest is a mediator, but this kind of priest is actually offering a sacrifice. And we know, of course, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice. Uh, because in the Old Testament, you know, there were three major roles, weren't there, um, you know, in the nation of Israel, kings, prophets, and priests. And sometimes they overlapped. Sometimes you had a priest who was a prophet or a king who was a prophet. David was a king and a prophet. But you never had the three of them in one. Never. And, of course, they were supposed to be, if God hadn't called you to such a ministry, you better stay away from it. So one of the reasons why Saul got into so much trouble, the king before David, is because he was a king and he got involved in sacrificing. And God, God, Samuel said to him, God hasn't told you to sacrifice. You're now taking the role of a priest. See, so they were, God was very strict and you know, specific on this. You had to be called to it. No one in the Old Testament was a king, priest, and prophet. King meaning, obviously, a ruler over God's people. A prophet is obviously somebody who brings God's word to the people. And a priest is somebody who brings the people to God. So notice the difference between the two. A prophet brings God to the people. A priest brings the people to God. And Jesus was king, prophet, and priest. All of them. They all met in him. All the work that he did. So, you know, you see the, the, when he says the council of peace shall beat between them both. Um, you know, there's something significant there. Notice verse 13. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. We've already looked at that, actually, in terms of the church. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. He shall be a priest on his throne. But it, notice his name, behold the man whose name is the branch. And basically, this thing about branch is a title of Jesus in the prophets. It comes up a, a number of times, and I kind of want to share them with you in, in, in a moment. But before we do that, let me just run through very, very quickly uh, something quite important as well. Basically, when I started thinking of branch... I couldn't help thinking of trees, isn't it, you know? And not only was I thinking of trees, I mean, you haven't got Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> you, you got it straight away, sister. you haven't got, you know, it's not just trees, but I started thinking to myself, significant and important trees in the Bible. One of them is an olive tree. In fact, Gethsemane was full of olive trees. And, and so I found myself thinking of, like, olive trees, and basically then, from olive trees, you get olives. And that, of course, is where we get olive oil from. Now, like my mind now is going bump, 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 bump. And I follow in this thread. And I come to realize that olive oil in the Old Testament was used for different things. Specifically. Now, but by the way, this is how they got the olive oil, right? What they would do is that they... And you, you notice now the parallels with Jesus, right? They would beat the tree, right? They would beat the tree. And then when the olives fell off, they would crush the olives. Now, what does Isaiah 53 say? It pleased the Lord to crush him. He cru they crushed the olives, and then what came from the olives was the juice, the olive oil. And of course, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, right? And they used to use olive oil for certain things. Let me run through them really quickly, okay? Number one, fuel for lamps. To see where they go in. Darkness, in darkness. But the, la but the lamps would help you to find your way. And that's in Ezekiel 27, 20, for those that are taking notes. We could talk all day about just that, couldn't we? But you get the point, don't you? You know, from Jesus comes the Holy Spirit because of his work on the cross. The Holy Spirit leads us out of darkness. Powerful stuff. Another one, of course, is anointing. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 1 they used olive oil for that and anointing of course was to do with being set apart set apart for purpose set apart for, for ministry once again we could go on for a long time talking about, about that too 
The third one you find in 1 Kings 5, verse 1. You'll see the parallel straight away with this. Olive oil was used for trade and exchange. In other words, that's how they traded, like we would with money. And with olive oil, they could purchase things. Now, the verse that comes to my mind straight away is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin, God made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <laughs> in other words, there's been an exchange at the cross where Jesus takes upon himself our sin, and we get out of that his righteousness. Now, can you think of a better exchange? What an exchange that Jesus takes my sin and gives me his perfection, his perfect, flawless reputation and credit before God. So now when I stand before God, he sees me as the same as Jesus. Powerful, powerful stuff. I mean, how righteous do you think you are? I would say 100% because Jesus is. And if you're in Christ Jesus, you are absolutely righteous in God's eyes. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And here's another one, uh, which is in the New Testament. It's in Luke chapter 10, verse 34. It's the story of the Good Samaritan uh, when, when, he, when he finds the guy who's beaten up on the side of the road, right? And he wants to apply something to his wounds. What does he apply? Olive oil. And God said to me, healing for wounds. Healing for wounds. I would like to talk to you. I could talk to you all day. This, uh, this is the problem, you see, in a time. I could like, I'd like to talk to you all day about how God has healed me emotionally, mentally. Because I was beaten up in, you know, in terms of life now. I couldn't help myself. You know, I was vulnerable. I was broken. And God, apparently, is very attracted to those sort of people. He is attracted to the fatherless, to the homeless, to the orphaned, to the widow, to the foreigner. And you find all those phrases in the Old Testament. Basically, it's those who are helpless and they can't help themselves. And I was like that. And Jesus zooms in. I mean, he's, he's like, like laser beam stuff, you know. Boom. <laughs> I'm going to set that person free. You know, that's amazing stuff, isn't it? So you get those four things going on, going on there. And sorry to um, kind of go through them so quickly, okay? Uh, I'd love to pre preach on those. But that's more to do with his work. I would just like to talk to you now briefly um, about the person of Jesus in terms of how the prophets saw this word ti or title branch and how they applied it, applied it to Jesus. And I want you to see the fulfillment. I'll show you in a moment the fulfillment in the New Testament, Okay. This stuff will become more obvious now uh, as I'm going through. The first scripture that I'd like to turn your, your attention to is Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, verse 5. And it says there, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch. Remember now the phrase, Behold the man whose name is the branch, right? So I will raise up to David a righteous branch, and he will reign and do wisely and will execute justice and righteousness in the land. Now, what I've done here on my paper, you see, if you could see it, is that I've underlined the name David. Now, the reason why I've done that is because what that does is that that, that, that is fulfilled, really, in Matthew's Gospel. Now, I'm going to show you in a moment four scriptures, and they're all fulfilled in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew's Gospel, Matthew... Matthew's audience, basically, when he's writing, are the Jews. And what Matthew wants his Jewish readers to know is that Jesus is the Messiah coming from David that they've been looking for. Remember now the start of Matthew's Gospel? The genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. He's putting him in that, in that descent, in that line. And here, you basically find the phrase, I will raise up to David. A righteous branch. Now that fits us right in the first gospel. In Matthew's gospel. That is the fulfillment. And it's talking about Jesus being king of the Jews. The king that they were looking for. And um, of course should have received when he came. The second one is in Zechariah 3 verse 8. And, and it says there, I am bringing forth 
my servant the branch. Now, we've already looked at David. Now, in my paper, once again, look, I've underlined the word servant. The reason why I've underlined servant is because Mark's gospel, which comes after Matthew, is all about the servant of the Lord. One of the main verses in Mark's gospel is Mark chapter 10, verse 45, when Jesus says, the Son of Man, remember the Son of Man from Daniel? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, the servant, you see, um, not only in Mark's Gospel now, but in the Old Testament, is basically the most popular used title for Jesus. Servant. Servant of the Lord. There's a whole block of Isaiah. There's literally from chapter 40 to chapter 53. And in it, it's got a number of songs. And they're called the servant songs. And they're all about the servant of the Lord. Sometimes the servant is referred to as the nation of Israel. Other times the servant is one person who's going to bring Israel back. So it's not the nation of Israel, but one person. It finishes off, of course, in Isaiah 53, my righteous servant will justify many. Basically, in other words, there's a whole block in Isaiah that's full of this phrase, the servant of the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but like, let's just take our minds there just very briefly what that means. The servant of the Lord mean, means that Jesus comes to serve his Father. You see, Jesus was totally obedient to his Father. Totally obedient. In fact, he was everything that Adam should have been. Because Adam disobeyed and Jesus obeyed. That's why, catch this now, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul says that even though he was God... He made himself a servant and he became, yes, he became a second Adam. Basically, he became a servant and gave himself and died, on, you know, was, was obedient to death and, uh, you know, not just death but, uh, but on a cross. Now, therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that's above every other name. Why do you think, this is a great question, why do you think God the Father now, God the creator of the heavens and the earth, why do you think he's made Jesus Lord of Lords and King of Kings and has given him a position above every other? Now I'm not, because we're not just talking about Jesus now, the Son of God Jesus, we're talking about the Son of God who became a human being. See, he was man, he was a human being and God has exalted that God-man, or just for this moment, just to say he's exalted that man God has exalted that man and given him a status above every other. Why do you think he's done it? Because he was obedient. It's always been about obedience with God. Because he's created, isn't he? And Adam blew it. Jesus fulfills all what Adam should have done. In other words, he was what God... God Ad, Jesus was what God was looking for in mankind. That's why, of course, when we come into Christ Jesus, God sees us as, right, you get Jesus' obedience. You know what I mean? You might, because we, we, we often blow it, but we're accepted because of Jesus. It's powerful, powerful stuff. Now, here's another one then, in Zechariah 6.12. It says there, the man whose name is the branch, and of course that's the verse that we've just looked at, but in my paper, you see, I've underlined the word man. Because Luke's gospel, <laughs> this is bizarre, Luke's gospel, which is the third gospel, is all about the humanity of Jesus. The focus is on the humanity of Jesus. And it's all about how Jesus felt tired, how Jesus got hungry, how Jesus wept, how Jesus went through everything like a human being goes through. So he's the man. So we've already seen that he's from David, We've already seen that he's a servant, and we've already now focused on the fact that he's human. You know, no wonder the book of Hebrews says that we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, for he's been tempted in every way like we are, but yet he didn't sin. So, like, I mean, one preacher once said it like this, when Jesus went back to heaven, he went like, ah, poof, they got it hard down there. 
<laughs> and I think there's something true in that. Jesus sympathizes with us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Because <laughs> sometimes I'm, you know, I don't cut the mustard. But, but Jesus says, I sympathize with you. I'm for you. I'm for you. Powerful, powerful stuff. You enjoying this? It's good stuff, isn't it? Let me show you the last one then. In Isaiah 4.2. There's got to be one missing, I suppose, isn't it? Now, we've looked at David. He's come from, he comes from the line of David. We looked at the fact that he was a servant, um, which, of course, we could spend hours talking about these things. We've looked at the fact that he was human. Well, there's got to be one missing. He's divine as well, isn't he? And if you look in Isaiah 4.2, it says there, In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be glorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The branch of the Lord shall be glorious. Now, I don't know, like with me, on my paper, look, I've under, underlined the word Lord. Because that's the focus. He's not only from David, he's also from the Lord. This one is divine. Amen. He's the God-man. Now, we've already looked at Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What's John all about? The divinity of Christ. You see, it's John who says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, John's focus is on the divinity of Christ, the fact that he was divine. It's John who records in John 8, and this is a great story. Um, basically, Jesus, you know, they, they, the, the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus, and Jesus says to them, um, you are of your father, the devil, basically. He says to them, which is quite a, quite a thing to say to a Jewish person. You are of your father, the devil. And they say to him, we only have one father, who is Abraham. And Jesus says to them, if, far, if Abraham was your father, you would want to do the works of Abraham. And then he says this, and Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced in it. And they said to him, saw your day? You're not even 50 years old. How can you say that Abraham saw your day? And Jesus says this, before Abraham was, I am. Now basically, now that's an amazing statement, because Jesus didn't say, before Abraham was, I was. Because that may have put him before Abraham, but to say, before Abraham was, I was, could still make him to be a created being, couldn't it? That could still be God created him before he created Adam, uh, Abraham. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses would believe, that Jesus is just a created being. If he'd said before Abraham was, I was, that could still put him in the category of creation. You see that? He doesn't say that. What he says is before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you know your Bible, what Jesus is saying is that he's like, he's saying to the Jews there, do you remember the guy or the person that spoke to Moses from the burning bush and said, I am sending you into Egypt to set my people free? Jesus says, I was there. That was me. What bush? <laughs> and it's like, I mean, what, to take that title upon yourself, hey, is enough to get you crucified. <laughs> is enough to get you crucified. You take that title on yourself. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. Before Abraham was, I am. Now, I am, I tell you, man, you feel like getting on your knees when you hear a statement like that. For God to call himself, I am, just basically means I am, just, I just am. I am self-existent, I am eternal, and that's it. I just am. I will never run out of energy, I will never run out of life, I just am. Come back next week and I'll still be I am. Come back in a million years and I'll still be I am. I just am. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, I am. Boosh. How must I just like blown their mind? But the point is, is that John puts that story in his gospel because he's hammering home the fact that Jesus Christ was actually God in the flesh. Isn't that amazing stuff? So can you notice how the prophets, they preach about this person that's called the branch? And from his place, he shall branch out. I'm included into that. He's branched out to me. 13 years ago in Cardiff prison, boof, the leaves tickled me. 
and said, you're involved. Get in, get in here. Come, in, come underneath these shadows of these wings. So he branches out. And then the prophets, they kind of like, you remember the diamond? They see that about Jesus. You look at Jesus from different angles and you see a different kind of aspect of Jesus. Matthew sees him as the king of David. He sees him from, you know, the king of the Jews, from, from David's line. Mark sees him as the servant. Says this guy, is a servant. He's come, he come to give his life as a ransom for many. He serves humanity. That's how Mark sees him. Luke sees him as the human being. He's just human in the sense of, because he wasn't just human, but he was human in terms of some of his experiences. He got hungry, he got tired, and all the rest of it. John sees him as be existing before time and puts him actually on the same level playing field as God himself. You put all those together and you stand back and you think, what have we got here? <laughs> Some of you felt like clapping then, didn't you? Feel free to get... You know, this is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And this God-man has come to set us free. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. He's come to set us free. You know, this is powerful stuff. And, you know, in a moment, we will um, open it up for ministry, right? We will pray. But before we do, I, I just want to um, just, just, just say thank you to God, really, for the word that Paul brought earlier. Where's Paul? The word that Paul brought earlier when he talked about, you know, his word and let it run through your mind. Because teaching is important. Prayer is also important. But teaching is important. And what happens in teaching is that God ministers truth and establishes you in truth and he'll set you free. And I'm telling you, some of the things that the Holy Spirit has imparted to you today, right, will take you on into the future. You know, like David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. I tell you, the word of God is powerful. You put the word in you and for some, somehow, I mean, it saved my bacon loads of times. It just keeps the pop up when temptation comes. Oh, there we are, a word comes up. <laughs> you feel tempted, a word comes up. God just goes like, oh, okay, let me bring that word to the surface. And I don't know, it's powerful, it kind of sets you free. It's amazing stuff. So we will have, uh, of course, ministry time, but let this word that we've spoken today, let it sink into your hearts. Let it sink into your mind and set you free. Um, and uh, my prayer is that you will be really blessed. I mean, the thing is, we can open up for a ministry time now, and it's like, where do we start? <laughs> what do we pray into? Because we've looked at so many things. You know, we've looked at so many things. Um, and I'm not even sure, really, how to kind of do this. Anybody got any advice? Please help me. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to pray for you, but um, how I would get through you all, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I tell you what, because I, I don't even have to rush off, you know, actually. Um, so I, I'm just wondering if, if we could maybe have the worship team up and just to play something in the background. And if anybody wants prayer, now I would have thought things like, I mean, you may come with something specific, but I... Looking at the things we've looked at today, I would have thought things like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to have a revelation that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, um, the healing that comes from the oil, comes from the Holy Spirit. Maybe you want me to pray for you in terms of an emotional issue or healing. Maybe you've got a physical, you know, physical ailment I could pray for you for. Um, you know, he's the branch. We're just channels, aren't we? But uh, I pray that the branch will reach out, reach out to you today and impart to you some, something powerful. Um, so I, that's what we'll do then. How's that? So I'm gonna, I'll move this out of the way. We'll do a little bit of ministry time for about 15 minutes and then I'll hand it over to Ken. Uh, how does that sound? Yeah? Okay. <laughs>